Hello everyone, and welcome to a special multi-part series uh, dedicated to the history of aircraft uh, told through Microsoft Flight Simulator. What I thought I would do with the series is just kind of go kind of decade by decade, sort of aircraft generation by aircraft generation, kind of piloting these airplanes, making some comments on it, and uh, just kind of seeing how things have changed over the last 115 to 120 years of aviation history. Uh, the way we're going to do this is we're going to start in the early days, mostly by decade, and now we're going to slowly build ourselves up uh, to the later generations when aircraft technology started evolving very, very quickly. Uh, if there's anything I know a little tiny bit about, it has to be about aircraft evolution. Uh, one of the things I did for many years is I work at an air museum docent for almost 10. You know, we had a wide variety of all sorts of fun airplanes. And uh, one of my buddies finally said, you know, it'd be kind of cool if you took a couple minutes to actually just, you know, talk about sort of how planes have changed in design over the years. And, uh, you know, kind of fly them around. And we're blessed with a wealth of different aircraft throughout different generations that we can actually experience this with and kind of demonstrate it. So kicking us off all the way from 1903, we have the birth of aviation. Now, in the early days, uh, the biggest challenges with aviation was trying to come up with something that was powerful enough, produced enough lift, and had a little enough drag so it could actually sustain flight. Uh, one of the other problems that was very, very common of the era, of course, was being able to control aircraft. And uh, we're going to be taking a look at sort of all this different. Also, you'll notice our material choices are very unusual, as well as kind of the fact that this particular aircraft, which I always find very amusing, has no throttle. Uh, it's just little tiny things like that. So kicking this all off will be the right flyer. We are sitting here, uh, lovely, uh, if, for those of you who recognize this, we're just outside of Kitty Hawk. Uh, there's the uh, Wright Flyers Memorial right behind us there. And of course, uh, looking down here, you can see the distance of their first flight. Now, this aircraft, when you look at it initially, you'll notice a bunch of interesting design choices. Uh, the first one is you'll notice the presence of a canard as opposed to an elevator, uh, something that was a very atypical of the day. Uh, next thing you'll notice is I look on my wingtips and you'll notice there's no ailerons. Instead, what we did is we actually took our entire body and we'd shift it, which would cause the wings to actually warp. If you actually look over the edges there, you'll see that the wings twist, and that is how we are able to control our roll. Now, the last thing you'll notice is if I look behind me, uh, we have a beautiful vertical stabilizer, and there's absolutely no way to control it. Uh, this simply wasn't an option. Uh, the other thing you'll notice from an evolutionary perspective is the presence of this aircraft engine, a very, very early aluminum one, which is actually kind of neat, which did not produce much horsepower. Uh, you're talking in the orders of 10 to 15 horsepower in a good day. You'll also notice that we're a twin propeller design. You'll notice we're a wooden propeller design. You'll also notice that lovely little bike chain <laughs> that's basically cranking the two props. So let's go ahead and kick this off. And of course, in our first days uh, when we did this, our instrumentation was also likely limited. Uh, we had a very, very simple tool basically for the purposes of uh, measuring distance. You'll notice that our distance measuring tool here is in meters. They are not measuring this in feet. Uh, the other thing you'll see too is a little stopwatch to kind of keep track of uh, you know, just how long we were able to stay airborne. So now that we're lying down, this is a really wild airplane. Let's go ahead and recreate that first flight. Here we go. So normally the way they would have done this is they would actually have had a little rail. And on um, this rail, of course, uh, you ride down. You'll notice that by the way, our uh, first flight takes place downhill as opposed to uphill. And you'll notice that as we get ripping, uh, we instantaneously crash. All right. So one of the interesting things was just the number of early flights required in order to safely get these airplanes into the air for the first time ever. And it was actually kind of funny that we did a total airplane there because it's actually pretty realistic. And here we go. We're on the way. So the first thing I noticed as a pilot, uh, both in the real world as well as at a virtual world, is we're not getting a heck of a lot of altitude here. Uh, you can see uh, very clearly that uh, we're basically flying in ground effect. Uh, the other thing you're going to notice here is, uh, you know, pretty serious lack of instrumentation. Uh, like I said, we've got a little distance measuring tool there as well as a stopwatch. And uh, lastly, of course, is the absolute garbage control. So now if I were to go ahead and kick my right rudder all the way forward, nothing would happen. As we saw a few minutes ago, there were no controls for that. But if I did have the some reason to urge to actually rotate this plane and roll it, you'll notice how very little control. And now, of course, we're passing by all the markers here. And I'm going to try really, really hard to get to where the first flight succeeded. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> and you could see here that um, we just about made it the length of the first flight there. You know, it just gives you an idea of just how short these distances were and how much. Now, the most incredible thing is, even though this is our early, early attempts, it is amazing to see in just a few short years how fast the technology evolved. Only six years later, uh, the evolution of aircraft had taken a pretty big turn. 
one thing you'll notice is that this aircraft, the Blériot 11, was actually a neat airplane because it was one of the first ever to cross the English Channel. Now, when I take a quick look at this aircraft uh, from the exterior, you'll notice that there's a lot of similarities between it and the Wright Flyer itself. One thing you'll notice is the presence of the typical materials of the era. You'll notice that I've got this nice, neatly polished wood here. You'll also notice the presence of these uh, doped canvas wings, as well as uh, significant numbers of cables, basically for the purposes of um, maintaining some rigidity. Uh, as you know from the Wright Flyer being a biplane, it had a little bit more lift, but because our engine started to get a little bit more powerful with our little tiny gnome down there, I <laughs> think such an old plane, we suddenly had the capabilities of basically um, achieving everything we could six years ago with only a single win. Now, there's a couple things that you're going to notice that were very similar between this and the right flyer. First thing you'll notice is if I look out the back here, uh oh, modern mom, I ignore that. You'll notice that we have a conventional elevator setup. But one of the very fascinating things about that conventional elevator setup that you'll actually see here is the fact that the elevators are actually a curve. They have a camber to them, which, um, although not elevators today do have that, this is almost like atypical. This is lifting the tail here. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is the fact that we have ourselves a rudder. Uh, we did not possess one of these. And one of the things I find so fascinating about the rudder of this era, let me zoom in just a little bit here, is you can see very clearly the fact that this material is very, very thin. And you can actually see the wooden structure basically supporting it, kind of that little lattice sort of structure inside of it, depending on the way that the actual light hits it. Uh, you'll notice everything is cable driven here. Uh, you'll notice we've got the little uh, net tail here for the purposes of controlling it. We don't have any fancy counterweights. We have no trim tabs. Uh, that simply wasn't a thing yet. You also notice the absence of any sort of bodywork in the empennage here. I'll kind of scoot, scoot past this little component right here. And of course, uh, you're sitting there going, well, what about the ailerons? Where's my ailerons? Oh, yeah. Just like we had on the Wright Flyer six years prior, this particular aircraft, I used the wing warping technique for the purposes of steering. Now, if I swing around the bottom here, uh, you'll notice our landing gear. Oh, uh, we're fixed landing gear of the conventional type. Uh, we didn't have really fancy landing gear at all, but you'll notice at least we're making an attempt to apply some kind of shock absorption from it. And uh, taking a quick look at it with the little wires, you can also see the presence of all sorts of little tiny components here. We could set the chocks to basically release it. I love the fact that the woodwork here, and again, this is just a few years later, you know, got a little piece of metal straps. And you have this little teeny tiny, this is Enzani, I'm sorry, I got the wrong engine here. Little, little, little tiny thing here, basically hanging off the front, and you can see our little explosions going on. Now, when it comes to instrumentation, there's none. Uh, the other thing you'll notice, uh, not only do we not have instrumentation, but we still don't have radios. Uh, nobody figures you need to talk. We do have a magneto switch here. Now, what's really interesting about this one is uh, you have two separate throttles. You have one for air, and you have the other one that is, of course, going to be for basically the fuel flow to the engine itself. Uh, the other thing I love, too, is you've got your little tiny caps for putting some fuel in this thing, and you've got your big old oil tank here because uh, they used a dry sump system in the early days. And also notice the presence of an early, early style radial engine. But notice on this side, we're not really truly radial. We're just a three-cylinder in a W configuration. So let's go ahead and get this thing airborne. Let's go! Oh yeah, ripping. <laughs> So uh, from a pilot's bias perspective, uh, there's something I really don't like about this airplane uh, immediately. I mean, you're probably saying, what is what is to like on airplanes like this? Hey, I like airplanes like this, just like anybody else should. But what you're probably going to observe is I have no windscreen yet. And on my right flyer, of course, I flew basically lying down. This aircraft has no exception right foot. <laughs> this is so dangerous. Uh, which you can't see here. Let me see if I can look down here. Is uh, Notice the presence of a pipe, by the way, for the purposes of uh, controlling this thing. And uh, notice the uh, tremendous amount of work I have to do in order to keep this thing going in a straight line. <laughs> so from a pilot's perspective, uh, probably not an ideal airplane to operate. Uh, one thing I do appreciate is the clippity-clap of the engine. There's uh, something very raw and satisfying about something like that, but um, I'm not really a fan of the handling, and I imagine if there were any form of wind, I'd be pretty much doomed. Another thing I'm not really a big fan of as an early pilot here is the fact that I have uh, no navigational instruments. As a matter of fact, I have no instruments. My instrument for speed is how far my scarf is basically flapping in the wind directly behind me right now. But this is what you had at the particular time. You know, we're talking ranges measured in, you know, 50, 60 miles. We're talking uh, flight times measured in uh, pretty substantial amounts. Uh, we have a uh, very, 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 very finicky controls. Uh, again, you've got all sorts of little handles and knobs and adjuster valves, and it's all right in front of me. You know, aircraft at this particular point were incredibly dangerous to fly. 50% of the flights would crash. It's just kind of the nature of that particular beast. Now, one of the interesting things I find about the Blario here, this is again, whoa, whoa, whoa pay attention to what I'm doing. 
Uh, one of the interesting things I find about the Blériot 11 here is the fact that this was used in World War I as a reconnaissance airplane. So even though it was a 1909 design and innovation, it was still utilized when the Great War came a few years later. Uh, one thing I will say is uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. And um, one of the things I find really, really awkward is uh, let's say we want to go ahead and land this thing. Oh, my gosh. No, you don't. I'm going to go ahead and pull, pull the throttle. Oh, my gosh. I've never had to use my rudder so aggressively before. I'll pull the throttle back. And one of the things that just staggers me about these early airplanes is the fact my engine just shut down. <laughs> so now we're a very ugly glider. <laughs> I love the reliability of these early airplanes. They're um, doo-doo. Absolutely doo-doo. Um, other things to notice here is, again, performance very limited. Uh, you're talking maybe 30, 40 miles an hour on a good day if you're lucky. Of course, our range, like I said, we're measuring tens of miles. Oh, sorry, wheels. Actually, that wasn't terrible. That wasn't terrible at all. And again, um, you'll notice, of course, that we have no brakes or anything like that. Uh, we also don't have differential braking on the ground. We have no tailwheel steering. Um, we're actually conventional landing gear style, and you can see that. And honestly, it kind of looks like somebody said, you know, Gary's Mod is a great source for inspiration for airplanes, which, of course, wouldn't have been possible because Gary's Mod wouldn't have come out to another hundred years later. So this concludes our first episode and our next episode, of course, we're going to be taking a look at sort of the early innovations. So that's going to kind of be 1910s through 1919. Enjoy.